Hello everybody. 10,000. That is how many bombs were built and triggered to secure Irish independence. 3,000 people died and 50,000 were hurt. Just how did it get there? What happened to make this possible or necessary in a modern European country nonetheless? I'm talking about the Troubles, the nickname for the North Ireland conflict between the UK and the Republic of Ireland over this area here. The British Isles here are made up of the islands of Great Britain and Ireland, along with many small ones not worth mentioning like the Isle of Muck. These islands have a long history. Basically they were settled by Celtic people before written history. Britain was then invaded and settled by many groups while Ireland remained mostly Celtic. This does not mean that they were behind or anything. They had the written word, nobles that spoke Latin and Christianity just like the rest of Europe throughout the Middle Ages. But they were independent and spoke Irish at this point. But nothing lasts forever I'm afraid and eventually once the English were unified and had taken Wales they turned their eyes to the island to their west. A series of British monarchs slowly took over more and more of the Irish island. And because Ireland had no united monarch they could not fight back effectively. So Ireland came under English control. The official language was English and now Irish cultural practices were often suppressed and banned. This makes Ireland the first nation that England ever colonized. Some historians even suggest that the experience in Ireland is what taught the British how to colonize a place. Divide and conquer. Eventually the European continent had a whole thing about the Pope and some list or something and eventually the English king decided that England would be independent from the Pope and made his own religion in which he is the boss. Uh, still got Jesus though. The Irish told the English to fuck off and barely any of them converted to Protestantism. Then 300 years later England, Scotland and Ireland were officially united into the United Kingdom. Yes I called it England on purpose for now. Despite this long occupation the Irish language and Catholic religion survived even though at this point almost everyone spoke English. At this point I would like to thank my sponsor you. Yes you, your clicks, your likes, your comments and donations are the lifeblood of the channel. No real sponsor could ever be as generous as all of you are to my channel. You're the ones who enable me to do my job full time. It really means a lot and as a thank you uh, for donations you get some perks uh, like you get to be in the outro, you can join the Wikicore discord server and you can have your name read out at the end of the video all depending on the level of donation. And if you don't want to pay for the discord server I entirely understand. So there's a free five person invite link under every new video which I upload. So if you hit the bell and are fast you get in for free. Why five people and not 50? Uh, because the moderators and I only have so much capacity. Thank you for watching and thank you for paying me. By 1845 Ireland was thoroughly in the hand of the British Empire. Almost all land was owned by the British absentee landlords who never even saw the land they owned. But they demanded taxes on it. And to make as much money as possible you would need a crop that grows well in Irish soil like potatoes. You know what happened next. Potato blight came onto the island and destroyed the entire crop in 1845 causing massive starvation. But hey England was in the middle of the industrial revolution right now so I'm sure that they could prevent the famine from becoming too bad right? Well they could and some aid came to the island early into the famine times but the English parliament was taken over by the Whigs and they decided to seize it all aid because the free market would surely deal with this on its own if left to itself. So one million people starved and two million people left the island permanently. Usually a famine lasts one or two years. The first year the crops die and then people eat the seed corn and the next year there's nothing to plant. Because of British inaction and the complete destruction of the Irish economy the famine lasted four years in the richest empire on earth. Even the Ottoman Sultan offered aid but Parliament denied it. Almost as if the English did not care that the Irish were dying. When Parliament was informed about the famine they did not believe it would be so bad. When the absentee landlords were not paid they sent the English police to hunt down the farmers. And during all this time Ireland was exporting food to Britain. Why you may ask? Well because the Irish didn't own it. It was grain and cattle belonging to British landlords. You may wonder if there is food in Ireland 
Why did those landlords not just sell the food in Ireland? They could make lots of money, right? And that was the logic of the British Parliament. Issue is that Ireland was poor. So those traders made more money by selling their food in England while letting the Irish starve. There were calls to ban exports from the island during the famine, but the free market Whigs opposed that idea. There were charitable organizations in the area. They would feed the people free food if they abandoned their Catholic religion and Irish identity. Doing this was called taking the soup and it was seen as a betrayal of their Irishness and most did not do it. By the end of the famine, 25% of Ireland was gone, dead or left. This was a deciding moment in Irish history. It cemented that it was a colony and not part of the same country, like the name of the country would suggest. And it cemented the Irish rebellion against British occupation. The Irish had opposed the English control since it was first established around a thousand years earlier. And there were a lot of rebellions. This famine was just going to cause a new one. Before World War I, the British agreed to give the Irish their own parliament for home rule, which was really popular. But when the war started in 1914, they delayed it. And delayed it again and again. And eventually it came to blows in 1916 during the Easter week. The main fighting forces were the armed Irish volunteers led by some pro-independence politicians. Their aim was to remove the British from the island and achieving home rule. You see, by this time monarchy was out and nation states were in. A nation state is a country with only one ethnicity in it. A country for the Germans, one for the English and why not one for the Irish? They felt that they had the right to self-determination just like any other people. This is also why the whole story I'm going to tell from now on is full of people who are nationalists. For Ireland to get independence, it had to engage in nationalism. The rebels took the city centre of Dublin along with other strategic points. Their hope was that with the British army being in Europe, they would not have the will to stop the Irish. They were wrong. The British came in full force with lots of artillery and even a gunboat. They had superior numbers and more heavy weapons, so the rebels lost. Eventually, after six days, the fighting was over and of course the British just executed the leaders without trial. You see, the British viewed this rebellion as betrayal of their war effort and possibly even a German ploy, which is not that far-fetched because uh, the Germans did send over guns for the rebellion. But things had changed. Until this point, most Irish people wanted to reform their way into equality. After this brutal crackdown, people stopped believing in this. They started to believe in revolution instead of reform. A party that represented that revolution was Sinn Féin. It was monarchist in the past, but now it represented the hope for a free Irish Republic. And they were prepared to fight. This is where I need to explain Irish Republicanism. It's a complicated term which changed meaning a lot over time. Very basically, it was the desire for an Irish nation state where Irish people would be free from foreign control. Not to spoil the video, but of course they got what they wanted, partially. Irish republicanism is still around now and mostly focuses on the Northern Ireland conflict. The Irish Republicans decided that they needed a new fighting force after the 1916 rebellion. So the following year they created a new volunteer organization. An Irish army to establish the Republic. The Irish Republican Army or IRA. And it turned out to be useful because after the next election Sinn Féin controlled two thirds of the Irish Parliament and declared itself independent from the British Empire. Of course the British responded with force. They considered this a rebellion not a legitimate state. The British had their own forces in the area, made up of some Brits and some Irish, which were called the Black and Tans. That's why the good song is called that. Having learned from 1916, the IRA did not go into open conflict. Instead, they relied on guerrilla tactics. They would ambush British patrols, attack barracks and go for their supply lines. The British Parliament responded by banning Sinn Féin and recruiting more soldiers. The British slowly lost control of the countryside and eventually they would only patrol in cities, effectively losing control of the island. But that did not stop them from committing a massacre. Bloody Sunday saw British soldiers fire into a crowd of civilians, killing over a dozen and wounding 65. So the IRA responded by ambushing and killing British soldiers. So the Brits burned down a whole city. What was notable during the conflict was that most of the Protestants in the country were for Britain. Remember when the British changed religion? 
Well, they managed to change it in one place, the county of Ulster, mostly by settling Scottish people who were already Protestant in the area. And now the issue of independence split the country between the Protestant North and the Catholic South, which is an oversimplification. Eventually, the British agreed to a ceasefire and signed the Anglo-Irish Treaty, which saw the Brits leave most of the island, notably not the pro-Union Protestant North. The Irish Free State was established and it was a dominion in the British Empire. This means it was under British control, but it had control over domestic issues, just as it was in Canada and Australia at the same time. This is when they decided to split Ireland between the Republican, Catholic, Free State and the Unionist Protestant North, which would remain a part of the UK. This border would be treated as an external border, complete with border crossings and visa requirements, which tore families and communities apart, just as the Berlin Wall would decades later. The border was effectively arbitrary. As you can imagine, remaining in the empire was controversial. Broadly, the government of the Free State was pro-treaty and the IRA were anti-accepting the treaty. Eventually, after a whole civil war, the government won and that form of the IRA was defeated, which is why in this period it's often called the old IRA. The split from the civil war still exists today. The two major parties in Ireland now were born from the sides of the civil war and both descend from Sinn Féin. Also, Sinn Féin is also still around. But hey, the English oppression is mostly gone and Ireland is a republic. I'm sure there won't be any troubles ahead. Ireland then went on its way, working on the economy, being a democratic western nation, somehow staying entirely out of World War II, except for letting the British submarine hunters fly over Irish land right here. The IRA still existed, but barely, and they were active on both sides of the new border. And they still believed that the British occupation of the North was completely illegitimate and that all of Ireland should be part of the Republic. When the Northern Irish Parliament began filling with nationalist Republicans who wanted a unification, the governor instead changed the voting system to first past the post because he did not like the results. This way, Unionists, who want to remain in the Union with Britain, technically controlled the North despite being a political minority effectively forming a one-party state that acted against the will of its people. The Northern Irish government began mistreating Catholics and Republicans on their side of the border, raising tensions between the groups, leading to multiple large-scale riots. The people in the area wanted to be Irish, not British. But the Unionist minority prevented that. Sounds like there is a nation being suppressed and what follows oppression? Hmm, oppressed my people are. Turn my 2001 Honda Civic into a car bomb, I must. At the 50 year anniversary of the Easter Rising, so in 1966, there were lots of Republican Catholics demonstrating against their oppression by the Unionist government. Naturally, the Protestants and Unionists were worried for their safety. The IRA had not taken major action in a while and they were afraid to see a resurgence, so they formed the so-called Ulster Volunteer Force, which just like the IRA was a paramilitary organization. It was not supported by a state. It was an insurgency, officially. Unofficially, the Irish Republic supported the IRA and the British supported the UVF. The UVF immediately made themselves liked by petrol bombing houses of prominent Catholics and by shooting Republicans in the streets. They justified this as a war against the IRA. And if their goal was to avoid a new IRA faction, they failed. Months later, when Northern Protestants celebrated the victory of a Protestant king over a Catholic one, it led to riots between the religious groups. And in the end, 300 buildings were burned and 2,000 families were forced to flee. Since the North is a province of the UK, they sent in the army, again, to try to keep peace. For this reason, the IRA split into the Provisional IRA and the Official IRA. The Official IRA would take part in the political system and work towards reform, while working with radical leftist elements on the Irish island. See, this is kind of related to my content. Uh, the Provisional IRA, on the other hand, would be the paramilitary part of the organization, which had less peaceful means. This is why after 1969 it's called the PIRA, which I will just call IRA anyways because everyone does. Both parts of the IRA were Irish Republican, which you can tell because they proclaimed We declare our allegiance to the 32 county Irish Republic.
proclaimed at Easter 1916, established by the first Dáil Éireann in 1919, overthrown by the force of arms in 1922, and suppressed to this day by the existing British-imposed six-county and 26-county partition states, call on the Irish people at home and in exile for increased support towards defending our people in the north and the eventual achievement of the full political, social, economic and cultural freedom of Ireland. Clearly, they did not accept the border that was set half a century earlier. This is also when Sinn Féin split. The IRA was ruled by an army council, not a single leader. And in 1970, they started operations. Their goals were to defend Republicans in the north from civilians and fighting a guerrilla war against the British army. The idea was to lead to a collapse of the Ulster government and to cause so many casualties to the British that they would be forced to retreat because of public pressure. The IRA started off strong by bombing 150 economic targets within a month, followed by a year in which they planted and sparked another thousand bombs. The idea was to force the British government to rebuild, which would be so expensive that the Brits would surely leave. The UVF retaliated by harassing random people not related to the IRA at all. To really show that they were the bad guys, the Ulster government immediately introduced internment without a trial. They could lock up anyone without a reason. You may think that they would lock up the IRA and UVF equally, since they were both considered terrorists and operated on the same scale. No, almost all those interred were Catholics, sparking riots by Catholics all over Ulster, to which the British replied with massacres, like Bloody Sunday, where the British soldiers shot 26 unarmed civilians. Then the British just declared that the Northern Irish Parliament is invalid and ruled the area directly. Now the Northern Irish had no means to politically achieve anything. It was in effect a dictatorship. After peace talks were started and failed, the IRA decided to bring the fight to England and planted a bomb in the middle of London. Nobody died. Then they continued bombing London in places like pubs, which killed dozens of British civilians. The goal was terror. At the same time, the UVF and IRA were engaging in sectarian violence. The UVF would kill a Catholic and the IRA would shoot a Protestant back, which was criticized by the later IRA leadership. To deal with the continued insurgencies, the British decided to make the Union insurgents a part of the British army. That way they could recruit more Northern Irish instead of letting the English die. They also ended the whole internment without trial thing, and they decided to treat the IRA like criminals rather than an army. This way they hoped the public would turn on the IRA. The IRA in return changed tune. They noticed that they could not make the British leave in a year or so like they assumed before. Instead they adopted what they called the Long War, which would slowly liberate the North over the course of many years. For this they had a two-prong approach. To quote an 80s document, both the Sinn Féin and the IRA play different but converging roles in the war of national liberation. The Irish Republican Army wages an arms campaign. Sinn Féin maintains the propaganda war and is the public and political voice of the movement. For the long war, they decided on five goals, causing casualties among the British, uh, bombing businesses to harm the British economy, making the North ungovernable, getting support via Sinn Féin, and by punishing criminals and collaborators. This period is when the IRA made lots of anti-British propaganda, and they attacked the British soldiers rather than bombing many places, though they also assassinated some enemies and through Sinn Féin drew attention to the fact that the majority of the North did not want to be British. Sinn Féin was actually elected to British Parliament by the people of Northern Ireland. At the same time, the provisional IRA was still doing things like bombing British barracks in London, uh, they targeted military generals and such, and in 1984 the Mad Lads tried to assassinate Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher, but failed. The IRA planned a major military offensive in the late 80s and was donated 150 tons of weapons for that purpose by Libya, but the shipment was seized and the element of surprise was lost. So the IRA started bombing British soldiers not in Britain, like in the Rheinthal military base in Germany. Eventually, by the early 90s, the troubles became a stalemate and neither side was able to really do much about the other. In effect, the IRA plans had failed and there was an overwhelming desire for peace among those in Sinn Féin. 
The British government said that they would be willing to negotiate, but only if the IRA ceased operations. Then there was the Downing Street Declaration, which said that the British government would be willing to let the people of Ulster vote on their future if the IRA ceased operations. After a brief while in 1994, after 35 years, the IRA officially declared a complete cessation of military operations. Eventually, a few years later, the Good Friday Agreement was signed, which led to peace in the British Isles, for now. It granted Northern Ireland the ability to vote to become a part of the Irish Republic, and it guaranteed freedom of movement and no military outposts on the borders, as to not tear apart communities like the border did for a century. In 2005, the IRA officially gave up all of its weapons, which included two tons of explosive and seven surface-to-air missile launchers. Ever since then, Ireland was peaceful, mostly. The North now has the ability to vote to become a part of the Irish Republic any time, but they've not done it. At time of recording. The reason I'm saying at time of recording is because Sinn Féin was elected as largest party in Northern Ireland for the first time ever in 2022. In addition to that, Brexit has been causing issues. You see, Ireland is in the EU, so any European can go there without border checks. And there are no checks on the Irish border. So, in theory, all Europeans can go to Britain, which was a major no-go for the British after Brexit. Right now, the situation in the North is very delicate again. And it is entirely possible that Northern Ireland will abandon the UK and join the Irish brothers in the not-too-distant future. I know a few Irish Republicans who already bought champagne for that occasion. Thanks for watching. I must admit, I assumed that I would be a lot less pro-Ireland in this video. I typically try to be neutral, but in this story, the British Empire is clearly the bad guy. Killing independence leaders, tearing families apart with an arbitrary border, changing the democratic system to make the North a one-party state that does not represent the people, and not to mention all the massacres they committed. I hope Ireland will remain at peace. Thanks to my friend Cozy Prolific for recording some quotes for me. If you like this video, please leave a like, so like that I know you like it. And if you want more like this, I have a whole YouTube channel with stuff like this, so maybe subscribe for weekly content. And special thanks to my sponsors, aka Patreons, who are Theon Hartley, Alan Bow, Eric Betts, Nene Tema, V, Zander Corliss, Tusnik, Attila Nemetz, Bottom Bitch Lena, Carissa, Daniel Hyman, Dominic Zanelli, Emily Margaret Klassen, Evie Wren, Herdina, Ian Snyder, Kevin Sanders, Klastrop, Lazy Panda 234, Liam S, Raman the Villaret, Shocktuba, Sarah, Sean Murphy, Stemmasterchef, The Swiss Fanboy, Theon Gillian Jr., Turtle Not Wayne, Travis and Yamil.